Welcome everybody uh, to this call CBUA sponsored webinar beyond checklists fostering scholarly publishing literacy to avoid deceptive publishers. Um, and this presented by Melissa Rothfuss, who's a scholarly communications librarian at Dalhousie University. Um, per our usual practice, I just want to let everybody know that the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted to the call uh, website soon after the webinar, along with uh, uh, Melissa's slide deck. Um, there will also be opportunity for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. So um, as to, so, so that we can minimize uh, the background noise during the webinar, I ask that you uh, mute yourself during the uh, uh, webinar, uh, unless you are pl uh, planning to speak at that point. Uh, then please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, you can ask questions and share thoughts via the chat function, um, and that's the um, the little, uh, I guess, dialogue bubble on the menu ribbon in the middle of your screen. Um, so you can um, you can post comments or questions in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat if you do, uh, if you prefer not to speak aloud or you're not able to. Um, otherwise, uh, I also want to let folks know that. Uh, in that menu ribbon in the middle of your screen, um, there are three dots. If you click on that, uh, that will allow you to turn on closed captioning. So if you would like to have captioning during um, the session, you can do it there. Um, you can also now turn, uh, for those with low bandwidth, you can actually turn off incoming video there as well. Uh, it, it will, you will still see the slides on the screen, but you just won't see the videos that people might be sharing. Um, so I just wanted to give a heads up because I know some folks are in low bandwidth areas. Um, before I turn the floor over to Melissa, I'd like to acknowledge that the Council of Atlantic Universities, uh, Conseil de Bibliothèque Universitaire de l'Antique, uh, called CBUA, represents member libraries from across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit, Inuit of Nunutsavut and Nunukavut, and the Inu of Nutasanin. Uh, the Beotic and Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. Uh, and in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Lewistook, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. And without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Melissa. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Cynthia, and good day to everyone, and thank you for joining me. So my presentation today is a walk through how I approach teaching our university community uh, at Dalhousie how to avoid publishers without integrity. So um, my thought is with more understanding about how scholarly communications and scholarly publishing works, uh, people will be empowered to make informed judgments about the merit of a possible venue for their research. So what you'll see is uh, meant to be a step in that direction. Okay, so today I'll start with a couple thoughts about scholarly publishing literacy, in particular as it pertains to article publication. And then uh, I'll move on to share with you what I share with uh, our researchers. Um, one thing that I would ordinarily use in a live workshop that I won't be using here uh, is real examples. And um, people familiar with the issue of predatory publishing and some of the work around it uh, have probably heard of Jeffrey Beal. He was a librarian uh, formerly at the University of Colorado. Um, and you might know him because he was uh, the earliest, if not um, among, well, yeah, I think he was the earliest to sound the alarm uh, that predatory publishing is a thing. Uh, and he coined the term uh, predatory open access publishing. Uh, he kept a list called Beale's List of suspected threats, um, uh, of suspected um, predatory journals and publishers, and that made him and his employer um, sort of the object of some uh, unwanted attention uh, and um, the potential object of some lawsuits. So the details are a little bit murky, but as I understand it, Beale is now retired. Uh, he no longer maintains his list personally, as far as I know, and um, I personally am nowhere close to retirement and I hate the idea of being sued, uh, so I'm choosing to play it safe here. I'll, I'll talk about examples, but not actually show any, just in case. OK, so before we start in earnest, though, when uh, you guys registered, one person suggested that approaches to these kinds of conversations um, can be challenging, and um, it would be nice if I touched on that. So 
Uh, I'll address that to the extent that I can. I'm still relatively new in my own position, so I'm I'm still figuring those things out myself. Um, but one thing that I would recommend uh, doing to either try to get more attention or to avoid um, any resistance maybe even to talking about predatory publishing in particular is to frame the discussion in a more palatable way. So more about how choosing good outlets will result in highest the highest impact for your work. So frame it more in terms of like a positive way. How can this be beneficial to you? How can you overcome uh, hurdles or avoid missteps in order to make your research really, really pop and be effective? Um, so that's that's one way that I've uh, tried to frame it in, in order to get a little bit more attention. Um, another thing that I've been doing and I've yet to see how effective it is, is to kind of identify potential allies and champions uh, among different faculty members. So if I have a webinar, I look and I see uh, who's registered and who is attended and, and who they are, what faculty they're from. Um, I happened to get the name uh, from a student of a faculty member who had gone off on a tangent in, in a lecture on predatory publishing. So I, I made a note of, of who that person was. Um, and also another thing to consider is because scholarly communications really encompasses the whole process of research, it, a lot of times you can segue from, from other topics. So another example, uh, I relatively recently was in a class talking about scoping reviews because I'm also a health sciences librarian. And so I was a guest for a, a graduate nursing uh, class. And as we were talking about scoping reviews, uh, I managed to uh, mix in there uh, some discussion of predatory publishing. So it, it, it works and it's a way to kind of get these uh, conversations moving, get some awareness out there um, in a way that might not be as direct because, you know, sometimes people um, think, oh, I already know uh, this or I don't have time to deal with this or that's all nice, but it really doesn't have anything to do with me. So taking advantage of whatever opportunities present themselves is um, is one of the things that I'm trying to do myself. OK, so. The first time I went to present on predatory publishing, I thought that this was going to be, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. My plan was to synthesize a few checklists, uh, go through some examples and ta-da, you know, we would we would know what a predatory publisher is or a journal, how to identify it. Uh, easy peasy. But it turned out that when I really turned my attention to some recent examples, it was a lot more complicated and the checklists that I had were fine. I'm not anti checklist. I don't want anybody to to uh, be up in arms about that, but there are definitely um, some issues that aren't maybe fully enough addressed just by uh, a checklist. There are some really sophisticated uh, questionable journals out there that really can't necessarily be identified um, with just a, a quick perusal of a checklist. And what really worried me is that um, some of the easier things to check off, like whether a website has flagrant spelling errors or grammar errors, are also um, less useful when it comes to sussing out some of the more sophisticated operations. So when a judgment is needed, um, I'm afraid that lists don't necessarily provide enough support to make informed assessments and enough confidence to question a slick professional looking website. So a, a checklist might tell someone to find out where a journal is indexed. That's great advice. Um, but if you don't know what indexing means really or um, how to go about making that that check, the value of that suggestion is not fulfilled. And, and I, I fear that sometimes people um, just kind of instead of learning might just avoid um, finding out more information and, and just uh, stick with sort of the more low lying fruit. So that's why I started to broaden my scope beyond checklists. People are familiar with academic publications, have heard or seen things like DOIs and talk about indexing, but a lot of well informed, well educated people don't necessarily know what that stuff is. Uh, but when they see a journal pointing out things that they know a journal is supposed to have, you know, they think, oh, all that looks good, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, you kind of need to know a little bit more about what those things are and where they come from in order to appreciate just how uh, useful they are. So I like the term scholarly publishing literacy because it seems to fit very well with what people need to have to make good decisions regarding scholarly communications. And this is actually another term coined by Jeffrey Beale. 
and to refer to the knowledge needed to understand how to recognize predatory publishers. And on the bottom of your slide here, I'm including uh, a, a, a reference to a useful article that I found relatively recently by Lin Lin Zhao that uh, discusses it in greater depth and supports the idea of libraries providing this kind of instruction to our community of researchers. OK, so now I'm going to walk us through some of the materials I present at Dalhousie at different events. The target audience is generally graduate students, uh, research assistants, um, as well as early career faculty, although things can range. We have a research boot camp um, that might draw in some undergrads. It might draw in more seasoned faculty uh, and even librarians as well. So uh, kind of a mixed bag for sure, but mostly looking at uh, the graduate students, early career researchers for the most part. So uh, this is where I tend to start. What is open access anyway? So even if the focus of a presentation is on predatory journals, I take the opportunity to provide some education around OA. Uh, it's relevant because there's a lot of confusion and conflation of OA and predatory journals. So this is a chance to offer clarity around what OA is to better understand how it's different from something predatory. And again, my overall goal is to empower research with researchers with information so they can make uh, broad decisions that benefit them and their uh, research. Um, and I think that involves providing uh, a big picture. So I'm going to run through my usual shtick here. Um, and I do apologize if I go into too much detail for some of you. I know uh, some of you in this audience probably know this stuff very well already. Um, but librarians do all sorts of jobs. None of us are experts on all of them, and I didn't want to presume anything and leave anybody out. So I'm just going to go for it and um, here we'll, we'll start here. So to understand what open access publishing is and is not, uh, I think it's helpful to understand a bit about how traditional academic publishing works. So on this slide, it's one uh, and variations I've used in, in many presentations. It's a basic outline of the process, starting with the author submitting an article to a journal, the editor determines if it meets basic standards, send it out for peer review, um, once the article is accepted, the journal adds value by performing copy editing, proofreading, um, formatting, all at no cost to the author. At the same time, the author signs over rights to the work, which become the property of the publisher. Agreements, yes, they can be a little bit more complicated, but this is the process in a nutshell. Essentially, from this point on, the authors don't have any more rights over the work than any other Joe researcher um, at your university. They may not share or post it without publisher's permission, which may require payment just like everybody else. So in the traditional model, I point out that the publisher's revenue comes from selling access to that content. The cost of subscriptions uh, has increased exponentially, as we know, uh, many times the rate of inflation making academic publishing an extremely profitable business. And so those gains for publishers have been drains for libraries. Again, uh, we all know this. Um, and so that's one of the reason this model uh, has been challenged by the open access movement because of the cost of, of access. Um, another major challenge is just the rise of digital technology and the way we publish and share online doesn't really mesh so well um, with this financial model. Arguably, if there was no legacy of past practice, we wouldn't set up a system from scratch this way, but uh, this is what we're working with and this is what we're potentially trying to change. So the alternative um, I present is gold open access. There are multiple ways to make something open access. I use gold because it works well to show uh, the fundamental similarities and differences from the traditional model with respect to openness. So as you can see, um, the first two boxes in our process here, the submission, the peer review, that's the same. Um, as on the previous slide for the traditional model. So that's an important point to make. Um, where it starts to get difference is only after acceptance, the authors pay the APC, which stands for article or author uh, processing charge. Um, the journal then goes on and performs those same uh, functions, again, copy editing, proofreading, formatting that were mentioned. And another significant difference comes then uh, at the next box here where the authors retain copyright of their works and they may share and post without restriction. They license the journal to publish, but it's um, open. On publication, the content is available to the widest possible audience. So in the gold model, 
The journal revenue comes from the payment of that APC, which can range from hundreds to thousands of dollars. It's a good open access option. It works well with the technology. It's not a perfect fit uh, for all circumstances, um, in part because many highly desirable journals charge fees that are extremely high. Um, sometimes they can be waived in some circumstances, but they can present a challenge to access that per per perpetuates the inequities um, that we see in the traditional model as well. So to make sure that everything's perfectly clear, I provide this summary. Here's what I want people to make sure they know. They, I want them to walk away with an understanding that publications um, that are OA are open avail openly available to anyone, anywhere, without uh, an expensive institutional subscription. Cost recovery and profits come from charging fees to authors, and OA publications undergo the same peer review process offered by traditional academic publishers. And so and the quality is the same as you would expect, which isn't to say that it's all high. Um, there's some variety and there's a range within the traditional model, and so that might be true of the, and we would expect that to be true of OA as well. Um, but there's, there's not a difference in quality between the two. So open sounds nice. Uh, why bother trying something new? And again, pointing out, um, you know, those those factors that access is going to go away once people leave the university. Um, and I, I talk quite a bit to uh, health sciences and, and medical students, and that's something that um, nobody likes to accept. It's one of the most common questions, reference questions we get at the library is how can I get access again as an alumnus? And, well, no, you don't. <laughs> You're out of luck, so uh, look for open access um, because we do have those large paywalls that we have to deal with. Um, open benefits uh, governments as well um, because departments typically don't have access to expensive subscriptions, but they're still trying to make evidence informed policy decisions. Um, another thing and maybe to appeal more to self interest is that open access does tend to lead to increased citations. So the more people who can access your article, the more people who can cite it. So it does allow for flexibility and who can access your work and allows your work to have greater impact. And then another more self-interest thing is that funders do require it here in Canada, CIHR and CERC, CERC all require uh, open access. So good news is I go on to explain that there are multiple ways in which a work can be made open access. The gold model is just one of them. And uh, going quickly through the other options, you have your hybrid uh, journals, you have your mirror journals, um, and then you have your green OA, uh, which is publishing in a traditional journal while retaining some limited rights. So, and, and I go into a little bit more detail here, as you can see with the green open access, uh, allowing researchers to meet funder requirements while avoiding APCs. And um, again, explaining that green open access publications are published in traditional journals, mostly in the traditional way, but the difference is some rights are retained to allow a version of the article to be shared, at least in a limited way. So for example, a post print of an article can be deposited in an institutional repository, and this slide describes the variables involved uh, in green open access. So the three key questions, is what version can you share? and the three possibilities, the publisher's final version, the copy edited, proofread, formatted version with the page numbers from the publisher. Um, and there's that version, there's the post print, which is the final uh, peer reviewed version uh, submitted by the authors, and the preprint, which is the original final version submitted to the journal before peer review. The next question is where can you share it? Um, and even if some sharing is allowed, there, there still might be some restrictions around where that permission uh, is granted. So um, a lot of times, at the very least, an institutional repository will be permitted, but uh, sometimes there are significant other restrictions. And then there's the question of when can you share? Sometimes there's an embargo period where sharing must be delayed. Um, Green open access it might be a really good option if a researcher wants to publish in a journal that doesn't have a gold OA option or you don't have the funds for it. Um, you would need to check with your funder to see if um, if this meets the uh, the bill uh, for the tri-agency open access policy on publications. It requires at minimum 
a post print in a repository within 12 months. So embargo periods that are longer that uh, won't do the trick. Um, another thing to mention is that materials and repositories are included in Google Scholar results and tools such as the open access button and unpaywall have emerged to help researchers find more green open access content. Um, but uh, on the other hand, sometimes people don't know to look in those places as, as well. If they hit a paywall, they just look elsewhere. So some pluses and cons that I always share. Um, final tips about open access that I include um, is do you have a funder? Is OA required and are APCs limited expense? Usually if the first answer is yes, the second answer is yes. Uh, what are the desirable venues for your work and are there gold hybrid mirror options? And what are the APCs? Is green an option and under what terms? Uh, and then finally, of course, avoid deceptive or predatory journals described as legitimate AOA ones. OK, so scholarly publishing is highly profitable, as I mentioned, and when journals start taking in money from individual authors to get their articles accepted, unscrupulous people saw an opportunity and dollar signs. So as an aside to you, uh, within the scholarly communications community, including librarians, publishers, researchers, there has been a lot of digital ink spilled and many words uttered on the precise definition of predatory journals, as well as arguments in favor of using other terms. Uh, for my purposes, I have found it useful to continue to use the term predatory because it's in common use and something that people recognize. I do find it useful uh, if I do use the term predatory journal or predatory publisher to define how I'm using it. And that is a, a relatively narrow definition um, that includes deliberate deceit. So I begin this slide by explaining that this is a common view of predatory publishing as, as I see it, and that is um, people tend to see it as a for profit business that present themselves as publishers of high quality peer reviews research. However, their only goal is to make money and they will publish anything for a fee. So the definition is very straightforward. There is the villainous intent of the publisher. It's very clear. They're trying to trick unsuspecting authors as they skip through the woods to grandma's house um, into believing there's something they're not. So that is a quality academic journal of integrity. Um, they take your money. They don't perform peer review or other add-ons. So associated with this view of predatory publishing are those spam emails full of florid compliments, grammar errors, strange idioms. Uh, they may list no physical address for the publisher or that address may be revealed by Google Street View to be a parking garage. Um, they seem to be a fly by night operation. Um, this definition is as fine as it goes. There are plenty of publishers like that uh, and new ones emerge all the time, sometimes old ones using new names. Um, they are easy to spot as something not to be taken seriously, I think by most people. And I think this is what people tend to think of when they think of predatory publishers or predatory journals. Um, and that could be why sometimes we don't necessarily get a lot of uptake when we're trying to, to talk about this. People think, well, you know, I can spot that already. Um, but I would contend that the issue with that definition is that it is far from complete. In fact, it, it's quite misleading. Um, for starters, the term predatory describes um, dishonest practices, implying that there's that wee little innocent victim preyed upon by something utterly and obviously villainous. Um, but that really doesn't reflect the complexity of the situation. For this reason, um, a lot of people prefer other terms. One is deceptive publishing, which I like. Uh, I see it as acknowledging the responsibility of authors, mentors, administrators to ensure the integrity of publication outlets. Another problem with this definition is that a lot of publications operate in a gray zone um, where they're not this fly by night spam from a car, whatever, um, somewhere on the other side of the world. Um, but they're Offering peer review, perhaps not consistently, not of consistent quality. They, they have some qualities of legitimate publications, but also some predatory qualities too. Um, 
and not good, not necessarily something that I would recommend uh, you pursue for your research, but not necessarily outright villains either, and that can make them hard to spot. So to what extent these problems are due to a deliberate disregard of best practices um, to maximize profits is hard to determine. The concept of a predatory journal um, doesn't really acknowledge that there may be these journals that are making attempts at legitimacy. Maybe they don't know how, maybe they don't have the resources, maybe they don't care, uh, maybe they're just plain bad. Um, it, it's really hard to look under the hood and see exactly what's going on there. Um, and again, it's a problem because if you are simply looking for outright predatory or complete dishonesty, you are going to be deceived by those who are in that gray zone. And this is a big deal uh, for one, and this is something that uh, really needs the, the self-interest uh, angle can work for you. Publishing with a deceptive publisher makes you look really bad. It casts aspersion on your honesty and your integrity, on the quality of your work and your overall professional reputation. At the very least, it shows bad judgment and it does carry suggestions of sloppy work and poor practices. And this has implications for finding collaborators, funding, promotion and tenure, the whole shebang. The other part is that deceptive journals and publishers do great harm to the reliability and validity of the scholarly record. And that is not just some flaky abstract issue in this era of resurgent measles and fake news. So irresponsible and poorly planned and executed and or ideologically driven publications can be picked up by the popular media and they can be used to support dubious claims under the guise of science. And that is not cool and it's not good for anybody. So another misconception about predatory journals is that it's a problem affecting the global south or low income countries and it's not really a problem here. Uh, but in fact it is a worldwide problem and very worthy of our attention and I'm always careful if I show a slide like this to include um, a citation as well so that people know I'm not making this up. Okay. So what do we do about it? Identifying predatory or deceptive journals can be tricky, trickier than you expect given that gray zone. So it's useful to know what are good signs and what only appear to be good signs. And we're going to start by looking at some terms and concepts that surround uh, scholarly publication to make sure that you know, or the people I'm talking to, the researcher I'm talking to, know uh, what they are and the degree to which they can be used for judging a publication. So we start with uh, DOIs. People have been increasingly used to seeing DOIs uh, in recent years, and they seem like a good thing to have, a sign of professional thoroughness. I can give my work a title, I can toss it on the internet, but I can't just give it a DOI myself. So a journal whose articles have a DOI looks like they're the real deal. But what is a DOI? So we know it's a digital object identifier. Uh, it is a persistent standardized identifier at the article level which means each article has its own unique number that it keeps for life. So these are assigned through registration agencies throughout the world in North America. This is usually cross-ref. So DOIs do look good. They give a legitimate professional look to a publication. Um, is a DOI a sign that a journal is legitimate? And when I say legitimate, I mean good quality with consistent adherence to sound peer review practices. Well, if we go to Crossref's website, we see that DOIs are assigned by publishers who are members. OK, so what do you have to do to be a member? You have to agree to member terms. What are the member terms? The member terms have to do with practices intended to keep those DOIs functional and meaningful. So any publisher who mints DOIs has committed to being in business for a while and, and adhering to certain practices related to their metadata, but they've made no promises and met no standards with respect to the quality of their content. So those terms don't have anything to do with quality control practices that pertain to that content. Nothing about peer review and that's perfectly fair. Those things have nothing to do with what D the DOI is for, but it's, it's not about quality. Uh, it's not meant to be um, and so keep that in mind. What about ISSNs? They look professional too. Um, the ISS the ISSN, making sure I don't have an extra S in there, uh, stands for International Standard Serial Number, and it's a unique number at the publication level. ISSNs can be assigned to any type of publication. They don't have to be academic at all, so newspapers, magazines, etc. Um, and we see when we go to ISSN.org, 
that the ISSN very explicitly does not guarantee the quality or validity of the contents. So DOIs and ISSNs are red herrings for uh, fellow mystery lovers. If you are thinking of predatory publishers as fly-by-night organizations with misspelled websites, perhaps run out of somebody's car, you can be deceived by these features. Um, but again, remember scholarly publishing is an extremely profitable business. It is well worth the effort of establishing journals with ISSNs and minting DOIs. Uh, don't be fooled by these bells and whistles is my advice. Uh, another term that gets bandied about a lot is indexing and journals talk a lot about where they're indexed. So how is that helpful? So as uh, hopefully our researchers are aware, research databases are a primary way to find articles on a research topic. These databases contain content that are carefully selected according to subject or theme and quality as well. And examples of general academic databases, I always list a few, um, but there may be discipline specific ones uh, as well that you might want to include if, depending on your audience. I always mention that Google Scholar is not a database. It's an internet search engine with filters um, and it provides what more or less looks like academic scholarship or is, who knows. Um, even databases can be deceived, but inclusion of a journal in a database you typically use for your research is a good sign. It's a good sign of legitimacy and it's a overall good sign of usefulness of that journal because um, it means it's going to appear in places where people are looking uh, for that material. So for that reason, journals often identify where they are indexed on their websites because that is useful information. It's very valuable for making a decision about where to publish. So putting aside questions of deception for a moment, you do want to publish in journals that are indexed in the usual databases that you use when doing research. That way your articles are going to come up uh, when people are doing their searching. Otherwise, how are they going to find it? Um, so that indexing piece is super valuable. So for that reason, deceptive journals will lie with shameless abandon as to where they are indexed, and you are going to want to be careful to check their claims. If a journal claims to be indexed in Scopus or the Directory of Open Access Journals or what have you, go to that source independently and check. In a live workshop, um, I would come prepared with examples, uh, including screenshots because you never know when a deceptive journal is going to let you down. Um, I regularly solicit my, my family, friends, professional acquaintances to send me spam emails from predatory publishers so I can kind of get a, a good selection going from different disciplines uh, for teaching examples. Uh, it is pretty easy to find journal websites that lie about where they're indexed. And the first time I did it, I, I was shocked. Um, because I was looking at a website that was really slick, really polished, it had good detailed policies. It, 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 it seemed to fit the bill in terms of having all the things you'd want to see on a website. And of course, that was with calculation. They even had a nice little description of what the Directory of Open Access Journals is and um, how it's a useful resource. They provided the link right there to the DOAJ. They actually were like daring you to click it. So I did, of course, and I put in the title of the journal and it it wasn't there and I wasn't expecting it to be there. That's why I was checking, but but still I was shocked. I couldn't believe they had lied to me so brazenly. Uh, I even wondered, well, maybe the DOAJ is having some technical problems. Maybe I should just to cross my T's and dot my I's, I'll check elsewhere. So I, I checked all the places that this journal claimed to be indexed and they didn't appear anywhere. Uh, and that was really a loss of innocence on my part, I guess. Um, it was all audacious lies. OK, so um, as an example, I like to provide this one is nice from JSTOR. Uh, we find this reassurance that there is quality control processes in place that the contents have been curated. So that's just kind of an example you can show uh, why it's useful to look to um, a database that they're familiar with and that they use. And another thing to provide is anyone who does research related to medicine or health uh, is going to be familiar with PubMed. And PubMed is a key resource. What people often don't realize is that PubMed is a collection of tools, including the highly esteemed uh, biomedical database Medline. So PubMed and Medline are often referred to interchangeably, but in fact, Medline should be understood as a subset of PubMed. 
PubMed also includes other tools with different, less strict criteria for inclusion, uh, such as PubMed Central. And as a result, there are journals present in PubMed, but not in Medline, uh, and some of those are of questionable integrity. It is possible to check in PubMed if a journal is indexed in Medline. And again, that's uh, something I might show people depending on the audience. OK, turning to the journal impact factor, uh, something that some people get really excited about. It's a frequently used, not often understood. It's a metric available through Clarivate, formerly Thomson Reuters until about two years ago or so. And it's found in the journal citation reports, which is available by subscription. So the JCR calculates a journal impact factor for about 12,000 journals. So that's a relatively small number, and I won't get into the strengths and weaknesses of using the journal impact factor for now. For our purposes, it's enough to know that it's a validated and respected a respected metric, though it can be misused. Um, there are many imitation metrics out there that do not use a recognized formula, so do keep in mind that they are not all the same. Because JCR has relatively few journals, there is no shame in not being included there. And um, I, I, I do think people sometimes need to be encouraged to look uh, beyond those, those lists. Lots of good journals don't have a journal impact factor, so it's not uh, a legitimate basis for judging something poorly. However, not having a journal impact factor and lying about it or laying claim in some way to a false journal impact factor is a bad thing. And um, so I present these terms and concepts because they can be used to deceive uh, the unwary. And I, I do think it's useful to have this background. Again, in the case of DOIs and ISSNs, while they may make a publisher appear to be established and professional, they don't make promises as to good academic publishing practices, such as consistent and rigorous peer review. Now, speaking of peer review, a lot of people are familiar at least in passing with peer review. And if you have more experienced researchers uh, among your audience, a lot of them will have not only have a long history of publishing peer reviewed works, but will have worked as peer reviewers themselves. But it's um, in a diverse crowd, you don't want to take anything for granted. And there's a couple points that are worth really hammering home, even for people who are familiar with it. Uh, so first of all, people need and some people will be more aware of this than others, but people need to know that the process is time and labor intensive. Uh, reviewers have to be identified who can reasonably be called peers to the authors. Those are people who have themselves published on related topics and will be familiar with the issues, the bibliography, et cetera. Uh, they should also be free of conflicts of interest and the journal should have clear parameters about what that means. Um, the process of identifying those candidates, contacting them, um, Finding the next one when the first one declines. Uh, finding someone to agree to do all that work takes time. Often several possibilities need to be identified and contact before someone agrees. And how many are consulted depends um, on the journal, at least two, often more. And the more the number, the greater the number of uh, reviewers, the greater the potential for the process to drag on and on and on. Uh, the reviewers need to be given ample time to read the article and write a detailed and thoughtful review. That's not just reading and responding, but checking references, doing other things to ensure accuracy. It's it's it, labor intensive. When the reports are in from the reviewers, editors have to make sense of them. So they, the reviews may not be in agreement, so work has to be done to assess the merit of criticisms and recommendations and make a decision. If needed, um, more reviewers might be sought, more reviews might be sought, and that takes more time. So this is really a critical piece here. Those editorial decisions really need to be guided by the reviews. The reviews themselves are pointless, and the whole process is a farce. Um, otherwise. So if three reviewers suggest an article shouldn't be accepted or should only be accepted with major changes, for a journal to turn around and accept it, um, with just fixing typos because it's a sexy topic or they need more bulk to their output or it was written by somebody's nephew, it's all a failure of the process. And it's not always going to be that clear cut. A lot of 
time and energy needs to be spent making sense of, of things when there are conflicting reviews. So what we're talking about here is I think where some journals flounder, um, and I believe some of those ones that fall into that gray area fall into that gray area here. Uh, they may have a peer review process, but they don't follow it consistently. Um, and you do hear about journals that someone has disparaged as predatory while someone else had said, oh, but I know someone who peer reviewed for that journal. They can't be predatory. It, this may be where some of that inconsistency uh, comes from here. It's just how that process all falls into place and how inconsistencies are, are uh, addressed. Um, the challenge is that this is a very opaque process typically. Um, and there is a movement to address that, and that is open peer review, which is still quite a new phenomenon. Um, there are variations as to how it works, and it will probably continue to evolve uh, if it catches on and, and remains a thing, which I hope it does. Um, one thing to take out of this is that the process takes time, and understanding why it takes time can help people to appreciate that a journal that is promising a quick turnaround time can't be doing it right. Um, and while that promise of a quick turnaround time in just a couple of weeks might seem really attractive, it's actually an alarming sign. Sometimes you can get lucky and, and things move quickly, um, but you can't promise that. There's no way someone can promise that. So um, not a good sign at all. Uh, another thing to be aware of is that there are white and black lists um, created to help researchers avoid deceptive publishers. People do like the idea of a list providing a clear yes or no answer and removing some of the detective work. They are by no means foolproof. Uh, they by no means provide every answer. They're not a bad place to start if you have access to them. Uh, to the ones that I include here from Cabell's are available only by uh, subscription. Um, I would also point you to the reference I have on that slide. Uh, there was a comparison and analysis of the lists um, that I have here, which are quite interesting. Uh, there are places where uh, a journal or a publisher might appear on both a whitelist and a blacklist. Uh, there weren't a huge number of cases, but there were some. Uh, it's quite an interesting article, and I would recommend checking it out if you find it at all interesting. It just goes to show how much uh, judgment and, and difficulty uh, there is around identifying some of these um, potential predatory publishers. OK, uh, checklists do have a place. I said at the beginning, I'm not anti checklist. They can be a great place to get started, especially for people unused to thinking about journals in a critical way. Uh, think, check, submit is commonly referenced. It's a good representative of what is found in many lists. There are many, many more. Um, and so I tend to remind people that they need to do some looking and some thinking. Um, I do find that some lists aren't very realistic in what they expect. For example, it's true that journals can lie about who is on their editorial board and make up people or steal identities, uh, but confirming that that has happened is, is challenging and time consuming. And my advice would be to look for lower hanging fruit. Look at look for lies like indexing and impact factors, uh, which are easier to to verify. So to sum things up, run from your life from a journal that lies. Oops. Uh, not that fast and not in that direction here. OK, uh, run from your life. Common lies include where they are indexed or the journal impact factor. Um, because indexing is so important, I, people need to look out for deceptive or iffy journals trying to shock and awe visitors to their website with lengthy lists of places where they are indexed. I've observed that journals lacking or with suspected integrity tend to include a lot of what I call fluff. And that is resources that are not curated research databases as places where they are indexed. And many are completely legitimate tools, but they're being employed in what I consider a deceptive manner here. So for example, Mendeley is perfectly respectable. Um, you can search it to find articles that other people have put in their Mendeley accounts, but that's not the same as appearing in a curated research database. So I do find listing it as a place where a journal is indexed is misleading. Uh, same thing with Ulrich's, a completely respectable and useful tool, but uh, it includes a wide range of different types of publication. And to my understanding, information about whether a journal is peer reviewed in Ulrich's comes from the journal itself. Um, a long list of tools can often appear on a website and that can 
be kind of intimidating or overwhelm researchers unfamiliar with what those things are. Um, so what I say to researchers is don't worry about the ones you've never heard of. Just pick out the ones you're familiar with. If you are unfamiliar with all of them, uh, come see a librarian because um, you should recognize the tools of your trade. Um, if none of the tools of your trade are listed, that's that's also something to, to keep in mind here. Um, they either need guidance on where to do the research or they need help to verify that fluff is fluff. And that's something that we librarians, I think, should be prepared to do. Other tips, uh, look at sample articles. It's time consuming, but so is doing research and doing research is expensive. We, um, It's worth the effort to look at sample articles. Does the final product indicate that the journal has been doing what it's supposed to do? Uh, and look at more than one. Quality may be inconsistent, which a single article won't tell you. Also consider Googling the journal title with the word predatory uh, and see if anything comes up. You could also do this with the publisher's uh, name as well. And so before we move on, uh, just a couple uh, final thoughts about uh, spotting predatory journals. It's possible for a legitimate journal to look uh, unimpressive on their website because they may not just have the resources to make a really slick one. That doesn't mean they're not adhering to high professional standards. It is also possible for journals to have ISSNs, mint DOIs, have slick websites with detailed thoughtful policies and still be lying liars from falsehood and um, or just plain sloppy. Um, how can you tell? At the end of the day, what do you see in that journal? Would you want your own work to be alongside it? So I always like to end things on a positive note after telling everyone to look for bad guys everywhere. Uh, what can researchers, especially ones still in graduate school or at fledging, a fledgling stage in their career, do to find appropriate and honest outlets for their work? Um, there's no magic way to do that, but uh, this is what I consider to be some sound advice. Uh, one is uh, look at, at where, what you read is published. What are the, the titles that come to mind from your work in the field? Uh, next is do some deliberately deliberate searching in the databases that you use. Use the keywords that you would describe for your own work. What journals come up? Feel free to ask a librarian for help, of course. Uh, consult with mentors in your field, keeping in mind that a great deal of experience as a published researcher doesn't necessarily translate into great skill at spotting deceptive publishers. But I would ask things like, what outlets do you have experience with? Or what are some journals that you know where um, you're familiar with the editorial board? And as always, use tools, checklists, and your own knowledge and critical thinking skills to avoid an unworthy outlet. Um, for people in medicine or health, uh, this tool was brought to my attention. It does the job of helping people identify where work similar to theirs is published. It checks for indexing in Medline and the DOAJ to avoid recommending a deceptive journal. It's the sort of thing that people can do on their own, uh, but sometimes it's fun and possibly time saving to have a, do a tool do some of that legwork for you. And so with that, I sort of uh, was trying to race through it a little bit at the end there to make sure we had time for questions. So are there any? Thank you, Melissa. Um, so uh, I'm going to open up the floor. If anybody, uh, you can ask, you can either unmute and ask a question or you could type it in the chat. Um, I found it fascinating. I, there's a lot of stuff I hadn't thought about considering. Um, so thank you, that helped me a lot. Oh, good. Yeah, I, it's it's kind of fun. I kind of put on my Sherlock Holmes deer stalker and start diving in and and checking. <laughs> it's kind of funny the things you can spot. <laughs> and thank you for the SAS Twitter feed. That was actually very amusing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I hesitated for about two seconds. and I thought all yeah. you guys can handle it. Yes, <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> so uh, please uh, uh, feel free to open up and ask questions. Um, Melissa is is here and she is the here to ask answer your questions. Have, or or if you want to uh, talk about stuff that you've been doing at your site and 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 we can get a discussion going as well. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of shy people today. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about other people that here it's very gray and just kind of curl up and read and be as kind of quiet and calm <laughs> as possible. And I'm just monitoring the chat here. Nobody's written in yeah, there. Um, I should have put my email on that final slide. Um, think about it now, but my actually um, it's pretty easy. I have uh, an alias that's just M-A-R 
at dell.ca. So if anybody thinks of any questions or um, if there's anything you'd like to share with me or if you're curious about some examples that I've used, like I said, I was hesitant to uh, use any in a recorded presentation, but I'm happy to to walk through some of the examples I use in um, some of my live presentations for for our researchers to kind of show you. Here's an audacious lie or here's um, what looks like a really slick website and there was one I was investigating for a faculty member and I knew my spidey senses knew um, that there was something wrong with this one. Uh, it didn't come to her attention through a spam email, so that would have been a, a good sign otherwise, but um, I knew there was something about it and I was going through page by page and I found reference to a different publisher's policy. Um, which I thought was strange. And so I looked up this publisher's name and sure enough, they had a close association with all sorts of predatory um, activity. So it looked like um, this journal had kind of just restarted again with a different publisher that they had kind of gotten to nasty reputation and were making a fresh start, but they hadn't updated their website carefully enough to escape, escape um, mm -hmm. detection from me. But sometimes you have to to look really closely because they are they are trying to be deceptive and they're anticipating that you're fairly smart and so um, they are trying to cover their tracks if they can. Are there um, other tools like Jane in uh, in other subject areas or does somebody um, bring those together somehow? Not to my knowledge. That was brought to my attention fairly recently by a hospital librarian. So I thought, oh, that's that's a good one. Um, but again, it's really about um, Finding finding journals in the art and whatever databases you usually use that are useful for your subject area. First, because it's kind of clearing whatever hurdle that uh, database has for inclusion um, in their resource, but also because a key thing as a researcher is you want to make your publications accessible. It doesn't matter how brilliant it is, how important it is, how um, how meaningful and impactful it can be if no one's finding it. And so it, it needs to be in a journal where where people are going to be looking for it. Um, and, and again, that's that's separate from the issue of uh, being deceptive or not. You, you really want to be finding an outlet for your work that's where it's going to have the most impact, where people are going to read it and it's going to um, to do something besides just kind of sit there and use up someone's time and money that it's really going to going to do something. Thanks for framing it in that way, because uh, uh, it's always tough when you're going into those potentially negative topics um, to, to frame them in a way that that will grab the uh, the audience's attention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I noticed, um, yeah, yeah, here in the chat that uh, Kristen has pointed out that that publishers uh, do tend to like uh, Elsevier is the example she puts up. Yeah, that that's a good point. That publishers do um, pr try to provide those tools. So. Excellent. If you're looking at, yeah, the, the big ones, that that can be helpful for finding a good outlet. That's true. Does anybody uh, have any questions or want to share what they've been doing at their uh, their sites or their institutions? Uh, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Just in case you're, you're speaking and you're not, yeah, and you don't realize you're muted. I just want to give folks a heads up on that. Um, yeah, we, we don't have to put heavy pressure on people now. Sometimes no. <laughs> you need to think about it a little bit. So like I said, mar at dal.ca. I'm happy to um, to take the conversation um, uh, to another time and place when you want to talk about uh, other examples or, or, or anything like that. So thanks everybody very much for your, your attention. Yes, and thank you. And I just want to remind everybody we have some webinars upcoming. Uh, on May 11th, Monday, May 11th at 1 p.m. Uh, Atlantic time, uh, Melissa, uh, another Melissa, Melissa Belvati is going to do an introduction to the counter five statistics. Uh, and then on May 12th, Tuesday at two o'clock uh, Atlantic time, she will be doing a, a, a webinar on the counter five reporting tool that uh, has been developed by the University of Prince Edward Island, an open source uh, tool that will be freely available for folks to use in their own institutions. Um, so those are all listed on the call website. Uh, so uh, you can RSVP through the links on the website. Uh, we also are in the hopper. We have one uh, webinar we're planning on controlled digital lending. 
And then we also have a um, the copyright committee is going to do a copyright panel and discuss the latest uh, in, the latest in the copyright field uh, and in particular the focus on uh, the the York decision and uh, what that the implications of that. Um, so those will be coming up. Uh, the copyright one will be probably the second week in June. Um, we don't yet have a time for the control digital lending, but keep an eye out. I'll send send out messages, uh, but also. Um, I uh, will post them on to the call website. But thank you so much, Melissa. This has been fantastic. I learned a lot. Um, I, there are some things I just would never have thought of. So thank you. And um, just to let everybody know, I should have the, the slide deck and the recording up uh, sometime later today.